We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hello, my name is Michael Jacoby Brown. I'm your host for We Hold These Truths. And today, thanks to the uh, power of the internet and Katie Chang at Arlington Community Media, we are able to host Noreen Dunn, a colleague and friend of mine and organizer and educator from Darjeeling, India, over thousands and thousands of miles away from Boston. So Noreen, uh, can you tell us a little bit about where you grew up and where you gained your values? Sure. I'll do it as you said. I'll do a quick background, um, which is a bit long. I was born and brought up in Darjeeling in the foothills of the Himalayan mountains, northeastern India. Um, I am, as uh, some could say, a Himalayan cocktail with Nepalese, Sikkimese, Irish ethnicity, hence my name, Noreen Dunn, causing a little bit of confusion in India and abroad, especially when they see my Asian face, my Indian passport, and my Irish name. Um, so it's very anglicized, so people don't understand. However, my comfort zone, Mike and Katie, is Darjeeling because it is a cosmopolitan crucible of ethnicity, religion, caste, color, and class. Um, earlier on, you were saying that it's poor but the kinds of education institutions that the Christian missionaries started in our mountains, all the neighboring royal families sent their children to study here. Bhutan, Nepal, Sikkim, Burma, all of them sent their children to us, to our school. So many of them were our class friends. Um, the, I was born into a Christian Protestant family educated by Irish Roman Catholic nuns in Loreto Convent, Darjeeling, and Canadian Jesuit priests in St. Joseph's College, Darjeeling. Um, after getting my BA in uh, English honors in the college here, I got my first master's degree in English literature in the extreme west of India, uh, in a place called the University of Bombay, because we were having tremendous Naxalite problems. in, And so I went there. Then I was very fortunate to get a scholarship to uh, the United Kingdom, particularly to Leeds University, to get my second master's degree in phonetics and linguistics. And then with God's grace, I got my third scholarship to go to the Harvard Kennedy School uh, to get my third master's degree in public administration. Soon after I graduated from, uh, from uh, Bombay University, I was hired by the Jesuits into the same college that I studied in, St. Joseph's. Um, that is where I taught undergrad students English language and literature 
for 37 mm. years. And I, and then I took on for 10 years more, 10 to 11 years, post-grad English. And then I decided to retire from formal teaching. I then continued mentoring my ex-students who now became teachers in government institutions for underprivileged children in our district. Why? Because they kept in touch with me and I could hear the discouragement in their voices. And when I visited them, I understood that they needed an input in quality, both in their teaching as well as in the students' learning, because there was no encouragement, no support, no infrastructure. I mean, they had, it was better than nothing, but it wasn't so good. And uh, I realized that we had to create an open, free, creative, compassionate person, and this wasn't it. So I loved that challenge. Meanwhile, I continued to be, as you know, Michael, the uh, treasurer and founding trustee in the, in the nonprofit that we started uh, 51 years ago, Hayden Hall. And it was started by my English teacher, a Canadian Jesuit priest called Father Burns from Montreal, Canada. This was a natural offshoot of the Jesuit principle of opting for the poor in whatever we do and creating men and women for others in our educational institutions as so as to manage and sustain these initiatives by training and conscientizing the real stakeholders in our world. And let's face it, two thirds of our world is poor. So I went with the Jesuit principle and Hayden Hall is now celebrated 50 years. Now we're 51 years old. And we continue to work for the poor and underprivileged, especially women and children, both in the rural and urban areas of our district. And our vision still remains, uh, at least our mission statement says, a healthy, well-informed, self-reliant and self-transforming community. And our mission is to respond to those needs, um, you know, with quality community and individual health care and nutrition and for children to gain access to uh, and complete school through supplementary health services. And we help cultivate a culture of entrepreneurship, taking a risk for the poor is very difficult and sustainability of their livelihoods. As you might have seen on TV, uh, such people are the ones that get the butt end of pandemics like ours. And for 51 years, I have experienced, not for myself personally, but I have seen the pandemic of poverty. In the year 1969, Hayden Hall began <laughs> with no money, no professional trained staff, just the just two of us students of Father Burns, who then became teachers, and with the single-minded determination of helping the poor women and children of our Hill communities because they were the most vulnerable. So primary health and primary education was our major target. The, the then team looked at the empowerment of women in our community and um, the utmost need of the R was that, and we started programs like Mother and Child Healthcare and Livelihood Centers for Income Generation, since these mothers were the main breadwinners in most cases. Hayden Hall then expanded from the urban areas to the rural areas because the infrastructure is even worse. There are hardly any roads. If you want to really be trim and fit, come and walk with us. The work never stopped, and now, 51 years later, with improved technology, our villagers now have cell phones. In the old days, I was thinking of smoke signals, but now they have cell phones. Enhanced skills and infrastructure, but with the same vision of enabling women. But now, Mike, they are not only the recipients, but also the change makers in their lives. We at the moment, at the moment, have about 48 study centers, uh, 14 sub centers, 66 women community workers, uh, community development workers, 76 rural teachers, 28 female entrepreneurs, 
And these are the sustained implementers of our mission statement, which is human development through love and service. And so as we look at the work we do now, we see that 80% of the change makers are female leaders who are a group of committed, well-informed and skilled women willing to take risks to make, you know, to bring about the change Hayden Hall believed in and still believes in. If you see them, you'll think they're just quote unquote ordinary women you know, but they're just great people. That's why the leadership course in Harvard and in other places should include such people. Can you tell us a little more about where you got your values to do this wonderful work, <laughs> this important work? Well, I thought and thought about it. And then I realized from a lot of people, my God-fearing parents, my family, we're a family of six uh, my, my, my faith, my teachers, especially Father Burns, who uh, helped to protect, I suppose, tap my potential. Um, my college friends, my school friends, uh, the NGO Hayden Hall, uh, my subject English, American poetry, Hayden Hall above all, and the poor and underprivileged that I work for and with. Because Hayden Hall grounded me. You know, I could be traveling to Harvard, even though, let me tell you, Michael, most people don't even know where it is. But, you know, it, it was Hayden Hall that kept me. So, but my later degrees across the world gave me a greater appreciation of the differences in economic, political, and social lifestyles of different peoples of India and the world. And thus I understood in a real sense the, the great divide of the developed and the developing world, mm -hmm. what some people call the haves and the have-nots. Right, can you tell us something about what life is like? You said there's very little infrastructure. That's a big word here. We think about roads and bridges. When you describe uh, the situation in uh, Darjeeling in northeastern India. Can you describe what it's like uh, so people who are not there and may never be there could actually understand? Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, it's one thing to be literate, but in order to understand, even like given, even now during our pandemic, to be able to get vaccinated, um, you know, one has to have contacts, one has to know where to go. One has to uh, handle the fears of people about vaccines. You know, there are so many little things that we take for granted. And because we have Google, perhaps, we have friends that we can contact, but they don't. So that was one. The other thing is language. Now, English, as you know, is the universal language of the world and of India, though some people would not want to accept that, but it is. And for many people, it's very difficult to handle that. But more importantly, if you're poor, most people don't even pay attention to you unless you're voting. And so that is where sometimes intervention from our part comes in. And so that has been the work of Hayden Hall to empower these people so that they can speak up and speak out. Now, as I said in one of my videos in Harvard, that I was so intimidated by coming to Harvard that I couldn't even ask questions of my teachers. You know, you felt that way. So you can imagine with all my degrees, if I felt like that, my circumstances, perhaps coming from a very small town, uh, that may have influenced. You can imagine people who are so much more uh, you know, who have greater difficulties than I have. Well, you, you mentioned you have been able to, you use the word empower many poor people, primarily women, you said. Can you tell us a little bit about what you did actually to develop their leadership? Uh, you also described that most of those women are the breadwinners. Uh, yeah. I, I'm interested to know the specifics of what you did, because that's something that 
is universal, whether they're poor people in Boston or poor people in India. Uh, a lot of the work of organizing is, as you say, sure. providing people a sense of power. What, what did you specifically do and how did you sustain that work? Well, well, let me respond in a sort of indirect way. I was also including my students who are not all rich just mm. because they came to a Jesuit college. And so most of the time, by just teaching them how to understand and basically communicate in English, help to empower them. And by empowering them and also trying to encourage them to think of others less fortunate than them, mm. that was part of my empowering and sharing that empowerment with even poorer people, people less privileged than them. But my students were no less underprivileged. Huh? because I taught in the arts department and a lot of them uh, really had tremendous disadvantages. So um, that is one of the reasons why sometimes I feel, you know, when we have reflections on, on uh, global warming, sociopolitical policies, uh, even, even our pandemics protocols like social distancing and washing your hands and all these things, you know, these, I think, are almost luxuries for our people who have, you know, sometimes 10 by 12 accommodation, have very poor access to water, um, have to think of, uh, you know, living from day to day. And um, in that sense, I found that uh, I had, by teaching the students, that freed them, that empowered them. Now, in the last 50, 51 years in Hayden Hall, in this NGO, we have been able to do that with four or five generations of people by giving them community housing. At least they have a small house to themselves. They have livelihood skills like weaving, sewing, knitting, um, working with bamboo, developing mushrooms. And uh, they've, they've had preventive health care daycare, fresh crash facilities for coolie mothers who carry loads on their back or chip stones just to keep their children in a safe and nutritious and warm environment was in itself so empowering. We were the first to start a daycare center for working mothers and then paramedic training for the extension workers in the villages, adult uh, literacy for the adults, preschool and after school education giving scholarships for such children in neighborhood schools. And this is all, I, we were doing all this while I was doing full-time work in St. Joseph's because we were doing this for free and I needed to support myself too and my family. So, you know, uh, when people talk about social work as if it's a glamorous job, I keep telling them it's not just nine to five. It's not all that is full-time. It's not just overtime, it's all the time. And so, uh, you know, I helped my students and others from the community also at that time, uh, Mike, with drug and, and, and alcohol, you know, uh, rehabilitation. And now we are talking about adolescent depression because of the pandemic. And so, so many of the youngsters that we've helped have now continued uh, NAA, Narcotics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous centers across uh uh, the district. And again, we have a lot of this emotional support that we need to give now mm. to children who have either lost a, a parent or whose parents are sick in hospital or who are going through online classes that are hardly happening because they have no internet tools. So much of this has to now be incorporated. So we are creating that infrastructure, Mike. And I know we've made a lot of mistakes, but because we've had this, uh, this previous infrastructure that has helped us gain the trust of the people. And because I was a, a teacher for so long, that helps a great deal. Because in our language, Nepali, teachers are called Guru Ama if you're female, and Guru Babu, if you're male, meanings mm. you're a teacher, but you're a mother. You're mm. a teacher, you're also a father. Mm. And that aspect is not forgotten by the community. So 
all of this has helped us uh, develop infrastructure. Now, unfortunately, sometimes uh, political parties and other vested parties want to uh, piggyback on us. And I don't mm. mind, but I do not like any political nuances in what we do. Mm. So uh, that's why I continue to mentor my students, hoping that they will pass this on to their children, mm -hmm. to their underprivileged. So um, I just personally feel that's it. You know, that's the kind of no, infrastructure. That, that's wonderful. Can you tell us a little bit more how you supported this work? You talked about entrepreneurship uh, and providing jobs for people. You talked about developing a daycare center. Was that done with uh, volunteers or how did you do that? Or did you oh, pay people, raise money? What? <laughs> in the beginning, it was volunteers. There were two of us volunteers. But later, we took on staff at very low cost. I even feel um, that, it, you know, uh, I feel embarrassed by how much we paid, but we never had the money. Um, and somehow, they were inspired to do this kind of work. So we got them from the middle class, the lower middle class of my students. And so they joined us as, as staff and they did terrific work. Now, the daycare center, same thing. We had volunteers who came from abroad to help us and wow. they taught us Montessori methods, which is perhaps one of the best, best methods that could be used even at tertiary level because you're, mm -hmm. you're teaching students at their pace. You're... Uh, profiling the students, which most teachers never do. Uh, you are teaching mm -hmm. by having fun. You are listening to them. It's, you know, Madame Montessori may have been writing in the 19th century for physically and mentally challenged children, but it sure mm -hmm. works today. Well, this is inspiring to hear what you've done with women with very, very low income people. Uh, can you tell us because uh, I think the lessons, whether they're in India or in Boston, are pretty universal about how you do that. Talking about a teacher as also a mother or a father is someone that cares more than just the intellectual development of a person, Absolutely. but the, but the whole person. I think that's an important part of being a teacher. Can you tell us over the many decades you've been doing this, what are some of the lessons you would have for other people that want to uh, be teachers and people that would really empower poor people. What what have you learned uh, through all your work and uh, experience there that would apply, I think, universally? Oh, lots. <laughs> Let me say, in the field of education, uh, I personally feel that educationally, Michael, particularly effective education is a leveler and mm -hmm. empowers you to accept life as a playing field. <clears throat> Even in a place like the Harvard Kennedy School, uh, and I'll give you my example. I think it was 2008 when Dean Elwood invited me to share the forum platform in the Kennedy School with two other classmates. One, Jackie Weatherspoon, who at that time was the state representative of the state of New Hampshire, and the other, Jose Maria Figueres, the former president of Costa Rica, an intimidating pair, given their <laughs> national and international experience. Wow. And here was me coming from a, a, a college lecturer from a small college uh, in Darjeeling, uh, deputy director of a small non-governmental organization, and I was sharing the platform with these two. But because they were my class friends, because we had had a coffee together many, many times, I was able to do that. But, 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 unless education reinforces you to believe in who you are and mm. not what position you hold and to see others for who they are and not the positions they hold, Education is not a leveler. In fact, yeah. it can make a terrific class distinction. See, hearing your own voice 
expressing it in my country without being convicted for sedition, listening to other people's stories, as Anderson Cooper said on CNN today, mm -hmm. uh, and also listening to district voices and other people's truths, as President Obama, whom he was interviewing, also said today. Mm -hmm. You know, I personally feel that my confidence to fundraise abroad came from that. Even when I was often told, Michael, you don't get breaks, you make them. When I asked an ant a big uh, entrepreneur in Montreal, give me a break, that's what he told me. And then I was often told by big corporate heads, you should know the judge, not the law. I was told by Ralph Nader when I went to see him about the consumer movement that he started and how he handled General Motors. He said, your people are so illiterate, Nori. You know, so then if it wasn't for my education that I got from my little town called Darjeeling and from teachers like Father Burns, I don't think I would have had the confidence to do all these things. I, and, and the faith that I have in my God, I really believe that. And so uh, the, the, the other thing that I learned in the development field, Michael, was that development of a person or a community, an area, perhaps even a country, I mean, that's too big for me, um, is, uh, means accountable, incorruptible people. How many leaders today are being accused of corruption and and different mm -hmm. types of scandals. So I believe development means accountable, incorruptible people. It means sustainable strategies, you know, so that includes love, compassion, service, that, that brings about behavioral changes in the stakeholders, not just us. In other words, right. you know, I feel so tired. Stop selling your ideas only start trying to serve us i so, think you're right uh, noreen uh, our yeah. time's almost up but i think the point you're making about being of service being uh, a teacher and in nepali it's also being a mother someone that not only uh communicates intellectual things but the values i think the values yeah. that you've uh, inculcated have really been helpful so we've been really lucky to have noreen done uh, a teacher and a mother to many, many uh, people <laughs> in Northeastern India with us today. And we want to thank you, Noreen, and God bless you for all the work you've done. And, thank uh, you. And we look forward to seeing you. Hopefully, oh, I'll can be I able say to. One thing? Yeah, sure. Before we end, I'm so sorry. I, I just want to say this. Please. Um, hence, wherever I went to fundraise, my mantra, my motto was always help us help them to help themselves. And, and you can only do that once you profile either your students or the people that you work for and with. Because as I said to the Kennedy School, it's relationships, my relationships with you, Michael, that change my world more than the ideas and policies we learned. Because human nature never changes. It's the same things happening to a different group of people. And that hopefully is the legacy I passed on to, to my students and my friends are my friendships with people like you, Michael. Well, we're Thank blessed you. to know you. Thank you. And for that, I'm your host, Michael Jacoby Brown. These are We Hold These Truths. And we're very grateful to have Noreen Dunn coming to Thank us you. all the way from Northeastern India. Good night. I know it's a lot later there. Thank you very much. Okay. God bless you, Michael and God Katie. God bless you.